All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome and good day. Uh, you have joined the uh, session on older adults, substance misuse trends and prevention strategies with Chuck Clubgard and Stephanie Asteri Asteriadis Pyle. The Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC and PTTC are funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA and are funded under the following cooperative agreements. The opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speakers and do not reflect the official possession of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. The PTTC believes that words matter and we use affirming language in all our activities. We have a few housekeeping items. Um, first, if you have technical issues, you can use the chat function and reach out to Rebecca Buller or Jen Winslow, and we'll be happy to assist you. Uh, if you have questions for the speaker, uh, if you could put those in the Q&A section and we will help the presenters um, get those questions and uh, address them. At the end of this session, you will be automatically redirected to a short survey. And we would have really appreciated if you could fill it out. It takes about three minutes and it helps us um, put together uh, more trainings like this for you. Certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all the who attended the full session. And it can take up to two weeks to receive those uh, certificates. If you'd like to know more about what we're doing or information on upcoming events, please see our social media pages. And now I'd like to introduce our presenters. Chuck Cligard is a nationally recognized expert in substance misuse prevention at public health and school-based health drawing on his experience in collective impact and prevention focused partnerships he builds the capacity of states, tribes, schools, communities, and cities to use evidence-based substance misuse prevention and intervention strategies. He specializes in behavioral health support, training and technical issues, and evidence-based alcohol, opioid, and substance misuse programs and policies. And Stephanie Pyle is a uh, meritus uh, and former project manager for the Center for the Application of Substance Abuse Technologies. Dr. Esther Yadis Pyle established Nevada's first substance use disorder library and clearinghouse at the University of Nevada, Reno campus. And during her tenure, uh, served as the CO one or PI for 36 grants and contracts for substance use prevention for students at UNR and Truckee Meadows Community College and problem gambling prevention for aging populations in Nevada. I'm gonna turn things over to them and thanks for being here once again. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, happy to be with you all today. I'm excited about the opportunity to, to work with my colleague, Stephanie. Um, this has been a, an interesting journey to learn uh, as well. Uh, I can share with you all that I am 62, so I am about to be in this population that we're going to talk about today. Um, our, our objectives are going to be to look at some trends uh, around misuse uh, and some related consequences. Um, spend some time right in the middle looking at some factors that place older, older Americans, older adults at risk. Um, we're going to definitely spend some time in the latter part uh, uh, looking at some strategies that are shown to be effective with this population. And, and as, as always, we'll talk about how to get started, how to begin and develop some, some cross-sector collaboration. So kind of give you some ideas about who to work with in this work yet, how you can begin to think about um, doing some, some focus with this population. I want to start with a broader conversation real quickly about 
working at, at population-specific prevention. It, it has long been a goal and a principle of prevention to think about substance misuse uh, by looking at issues around gender, race, ethnicity, orientation, age, and other factors. I think that for many of us around the country, um, there's still a greater emphasis on, on working with young populations. Uh, and I think that that's, that's been part of our history as a country, part of the history of coalition work, part of history of, of our funders in some respects. Um, so I think that's starting to shift. I'm sharing with you that, that I think the good news is that people are starting to really recognize what that means to, to look at context. And that context could be cultural, it could be economic status, it could be age. It could be looking at a whole variety of factors about where people live on uh, zip codes that they live in, um, a focus on social economic determinants and, and how those interact with a whole bunch of reasons that I think are increasingly important uh, to pay attention to thinking about population specific prevention in, in, the next, in the next decade as we move ahead. Um, I want to say a couple of other things about sort of targeted prevention. We again know sort of looking at very culturally specific and adapt adaptations for populations also have a lot of evidence for, for being more effective. So as, as you listen to this conversation today, think about uh, the ways in which you're already doing work in your community and, and the ways in which you think about adapting that work for this population. Um, I want to set the stage a little bit about talking about what's happening just with demographics. Um, we are increasingly becoming a more diverse country, uh, and at the same time, we are, are starting to look more like Europe. And what I mean by that is that the proportion of our population that is, in fact, 65 to 84 and 85 and older has grown really rapidly since the 60s. Now, a couple of things contribute to that. We certainly have a greater life expectancy um, and we have bigger generations that are that are now hitting uh, that sort of baby boom generation. And the ones that follow are larger generations that are moving into that age group. So know that that, that this is a, a significant issue that, that I think will impact us uh, in the years ahead in the way that we do prevention work and provide human services. Um, just a couple of things to note there on that slide. You're seeing that little blue bar on the very top that those 85 and older, those, those adults, meaning those that most often need significant kinds of personal care and help, um, are gonna, gonna double, or in some cases, in some parts of the country, that age group will quadruple. Um, so we know that, that just in a very short 20 year period from now, our community is gonna look different. And the way in which we prioritize human services and prevention programming is gonna have to look different. So we think now is the time to learn about how to do that. Um, this, this next graph is, is, is another uh, sort of swat at this by looking at proportionality. So just again, looking at just recent years, you can see that by 20, 2040, one in five Americans will be 65 or older. Now that's, that's again, a very significant shift. Um, I think it has implications politically and economically for our country in the way that we think about younger people are more likely to be engaged in working. Folks in that age group are more likely to be retired or not working. Um, so we have issues with, with economic sort of stability in communities that, that are gonna have to be thought through in the, in the years ahead. Um, we know that, that again, folks are having fewer children. So younger generations aren't, aren't necessarily gonna, gonna rebuild this population in the same way. So we think looking at the issue of, of that growing population, what it means for where you live and proportionality in terms of, of the proportion of folks who are gonna live, work in our communities is also gonna shift. Um, so I wanna do a quick poll that will set the stage for us to start this conversation with you all today to learn a little bit about how much knowledge and experience do you have with prevention focused on specifically on older adults? So take a moment and participate in this poll with us. I'll give you a few moments to fill this out while we talk about this. Again, I, I know historically some parts of the Midwest here have been focused so heavily on underage drinking, for example, that not only do we focus on one population, we may have focused on a single, a single uh, substance use issue, issue around risky alcohol use or binge drinking. Um, so the idea of focusing on another population with really complicated kinds of issues that are, that are um, way more complex uh, than just uh, one particular age group and one particular drug are, are really key. So thank you for sharing the results. It looks like uh, a lot of you have some experience, which is exciting. Again, that's that's encouraging for me, knowing that what's ahead for, for those of us um, who have uh, 10 or 20 years more to work in the field, we, we have significant shifts 
uh, in our very near future in the way that we do this work. Uh, so some of you have some knowledge, a lot of you have a little, uh, and a hand, only a handful of you have, have none. So I'm, I'm super encouraged. So thank you for sharing those results um, with us, and, and we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, in this next piece, we're going to, again, engage you a little differently. We can close out the poll. Um, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Steph, who's going to share a little bit more with you about uh, engaging with you about what you think about when you begin to think about the issues with, with prevention and, and older adults. So, Steph, over to you. Thank you, Chuck. And thank you so much for inviting me. I'm honored to be here, and I'm so pleased to see so many people wanting to learn more about this really important um, population in our country. Right now, I'd like to key in on some of the ideas and pictures that we have in our minds when we think of older adults. After all, as the baby boomer generation moves into retirement age, it's expected that by the year 2034, older adults ages 65 and up will outnumber children in the US for the first time in history. And as the population ages, the demand for health care will increase. Rising rates of alcohol use in adults, older adults may create additional challenges to an already burdened health care system. So if you will, type in the chat box what images instantly appear in your minds with the term when the term older adults is mentioned. You might also write about how you would describe an older adult or older adults as a group. We're seeing responses that say that, um, I think of life experience as well as generational differences in knowledge and experience. Um, uh, someone seeing their mom who's getting older and she's becoming more vulnerable and she's a cancer survivor. And so she's worried about her stability and her future. Some people are seeing them as keeping busy and active. Catherine said, I just look in the mirror, um, lived long life with wisdom and growing through societal changes, lots of wisdom and experience, um, independent, um, some embrace technology, some are resistant to change, again, lots and lots of experience and history, walkers, I like the fact that there's a lot of response about experience and wisdom and independence. And sometimes I think that's typical of the people who at attend a webinar like this, is they do uh, have a more open mind about older adults. Um, and may not have the same generalizations, misconceptions, or myths that um, people who do not work in a helping field do. So that's very encouraging, and I think that speaks well to all of you in the audience right now. So let's consider the fact that substance misuse is currently being overlooked and undertreated, and if you think this is related to our generalizations and assumptions about older adults, you may be right. Um, but bear in mind, not all of us, as we just, as you just proved, uh, not all of us are misinformed or make generalizations, of course not. But enough providers or professionals from all fields and the general public have some false beliefs, which can cause them to overlook this very important population as people who potentially might misuse substances. So they may fail to even ask the questions or to screen them for use. So now let's move on to some of the trends the data are showing in substance use among older adults. Um, and this is just a list of what we're going to be looking at as far as trends today. Um, Alcohol use, cannabis use, illicit drug use, overdose, um, any developing disorders, and mental health. So first, let's take a look at adult use in the past year. Here you can see some of the most commonly available data for adults aged 50 to 80. Two in three adults um, 
aged 50 to 80, or 67% reported drinking alcohol, at least occasionally in the last year. Among those who drink, 42% drank monthly or less often. So it's a little bit less than half. Um, on a typical day of drinking, the majority consumed one or two drinks. That is a pretty healthy norm. 17% had three or four drinks, and six had five or more drinks, putting them into binge drinking category. Among older adults who ported drinking any alcohol in the past year, the most commonly reported reasons for drinking, including just liking the taste, about half of them, to be social, about another half, to relax, or it's just part of their routine. Other reasons, about 10% was to cope with stress, uh, to help with mood, out of boredom, or to help with pain. Um, we know that men are more likely than women to report any drinking in the past year, and men are also likely to report a higher daily quantity of consumption. Now, according to guidelines, they're allowed to drink a little bit more, but that doesn't really account to um, one in five men having three to four drinks of alcohol on a typical day of drinking. Um, use of alcohol with other drugs, about one in 10 adults age 50 to 80 or 10% uh, who drank alcohol in the past year said they drank while using other drugs, including marijuana, prescription drugs, tranquilizers, prescription sleeping pills, prescription pain pills, and illicit drugs. Uh, Alcohol-related blackouts were more common among those who consumed alcohol while using other drugs, about 20% of those. So what are the implications for this uh, about alcohol, these data about alcohol? <clears throat> um, I think it's important to know that alcohol use is actually trending upward over the years. Um, and alcohol use among women is particularly trending up. Uh, as an aside, years ago, alcohol and drug use by adolescent girls was far less than adolescent boys. I just dated myself. <laughs> and then it began to rise to become more or less equal to that of adolescent boys. And the protective factor of gender for girls went away. So this same type of trend may be being mirrored in uh, older women compared to older men with more older women um, drinking. One epidemiological survey determined that in the US um, between 2001 and 2013 among people 65 and older, the rate of alcohol use of um, disorder increased about 107%. Uh, so we are seeing in particular about 20% of the respondents that drank alcohol four or more times a week, 27% reported having six or more drinks on at least one occasion in the last year. So risky drinking and binge drinking among older adults has increased in the past decade. And there's actually a binge drinking boom among uh, older people. And that's not a good thing because um, although it's important to know that enjoying a glass of wine once in a while can be healthy for your heart and gut, drinking too much, as we all know, can put you at higher risk of serious health conditions. And the, among those are um, certain types of cancer, stroke, heart and liver disease, um, brain damage, and older people drinking unhealthy levels of alcohol can be even more damaging to health and may cause memory loss, um, increased blood pressure and balance problems and worsen mental health. But it's, well, we might assume that alcohol is only damaging those who regularly drink above the recommended limits. Just remember that any amount of alcohol does have an impact um, on uh, the consumer. So moving to um, the use of cannabis, 
what we know about uh, the prevalence of cannabis use among older adults, age 65 and older, uh, is that it's being used for both recreational and medical purposes. Um, information regarding the safety in this population is an important factor because um, aging is associated with metabolic changes, multiple morbidities, increases in prescription medication, and an overall decline in functioning. Um, and so it's important to understand that even though we may have increase in adverse effects because of cannabis, we don't really know a lot about the role of cannabis in this population because it's mostly studied in younger populations. So we really do need more um, research into the effects of cannabis on older populations. Uh, we also know that older adults uh, with psychiatric disorders are increasingly using cannabis, um, largely prescribed medical marijuana and uh, CBD, cannabidiol. And this trend has possibly been driven by the fact that we have reduced stigma. We know we have lifted restrictions in sale and possession. And uh, a lot of articles, ads, we're exposed to a lot of media that says how safe it is. But the reality is we really don't have the research to show the safety and we need more research. So uh, some of the information that we need to um, focus on here is, uh, you know, what can we do about it? And those will be covered in uh, strategies uh, later on in this presentation. So uh, looking at trends in past cannabis use uh, nationally, subgroups uh, in tw a 2020 study were um, seen to have experienced marked increases in cannabis use. I think this is uh, one of the subgroups would be women. And I think this is something that we're seeing a lot in people with higher family incomes and those with mental health problems to um, self-treat. Um, the researchers in this particular study also saw an increase in uh, cannabis use among adults who used alcohol. And the risk associated with co-risk they found was higher than the risk of using either one alone. So it multiplies the risk. And again, we need uh, future research as the authors stated, and it's also possible that the study had some limitations um, because older adults may not have had accurate recall. Um, of their, of their actual usage. So what are the implications of this uh, data, these data? Um, marijuana use is now commoner <laughs> among, more common among baby boomers than it is for those aged 12 to 17. Um, the latest release of, um, Federal Drug Use Strategy Survey recently shows monthly marijuana use has skyrocketed among older Americans. Um, the past decade has seen a change in demographics of marijuana use. Um, as recently as the 2000s, teens were more than four times likely to use marijuana than 50 and 60 somethings. But as of 2017, Americans ages 55 to 64 are now slightly more likely to smoke pot on a monthly basis than teens 12 to 17. So the oldest age group, seniors age 65 and older, has seen steep increases in marijuana use, um, although 18 to 26 and older are still among the highest age groups. So there's a beginning to be a lot of debate 
on how about marijuana use uh, because we've tended to focus on younger populations and now it may be time that we shift our focus and look at what's happening to baby boomers entering their golden years. Um, you have to remember that baby boomers were big supporters and users of pot in their um, early years in the 60s and 70s and even mind altering drugs so that it wouldn't be unfamiliar or stigmatized to them, uh, stigmatizing to them. And so when they do run into difficulties such as pain management and mental health issues, they may revert back to what they knew. So much for cannabis. Now um, let's move on to take a look at some illicit drug use in uh, adults, older adults. So as you can see on the slide, illicit drug use among aged 50 or older is projected to increase from 2.2% to 3.1%. And uh, this, these data are between 2001 and 2020. Well, we're already to 2022 and I looked and checked and we're actually expected, uh, the expectation was that substance use disorder among older Americans was expected to rise from 2.8 million as it was in 2002 to 2006 to 5.7 million by 2020. And I did double check and it did, and that's double. So the emergence of uh, substance use disorder as a public health concern is warranted. <laughs> the relatively higher drug use rates of um, baby boomers um, compared to previous generations and this cohort may experience some negative consequences and those consequences may be physical, they may be mental health issues, they may be social and family problems, um, they may even get involved with criminal justice system which a lot of people um, may not consider even as an option for grandma and grandpa and they may even um, die from over, drug overdose. Uh, older adults are more likely than any other age groups to have chronic health conditions and to take prescription medications. And that really complicates the adverse effects of substance use. So moving on to look at a few specific substances. Looking at opioids, benzodiazepines and suicide. Um, older adults in one night of notes um, about drug use and its consequences among middle-aged and older adults found that older adults who misused either prescription opioids or benzodiazepines had an increased risk of suicidal thoughts compared with those who used the drugs appropriately. But the difference wasn't statistically significant. So wondering why they even reported it. However, older adults who misused both opioids and benzodiazepines had a significantly higher risk of suicide, suicidal thoughts than those who reported no misuse. Now, you might be asking, are they getting help with that? And that's a really good question. Now, the hor horizontal bar chart in front of you shows um, the percentage of patients 50 or older who reported suicidal thoughts, you can see 25.4% for both opioid and benzodiazepine misuse. So what are the implications of this, these data um, among our older adults in the US? When we look at trends in overdose, moving to the next slide, um, al although we know that the opioid overdose deaths are increasing for older adults, we know a little bit less about these deaths compared to those of younger adults. Um, there are disparities by sex, race, ethnicity, and death rates due to opioid overdose among adults age 50 five or older. 
So this, this particular um, cross-sectional study that you're looking at found uh, rates for adults 55 and older increased substantially between 1999 and 2019. I mean, we're talking about a huge increase. And the most significant part of this was that the burden of the increase was experienced differentially by sex and race and ethnicity. In recent years, risk was most concentrated among non-Hispanic Black men. And beginning in 2013, the rate of opioid overdose deaths for non-Hispanic Black men were substantially higher than overall rates for persons 55 years and older and the rates for other subgroups that were examined in the study. So we're beginning to see that certain populations are experiencing um, increased um, trends in, in overdose deaths. Uh, some of the factors that might be associated with um, uh, these data among older adults would be uh, an increased number of chronic conditions, polypharmacy or using many different medications, greater risks of falls and fractures. We know less about the factors that are associated with the opioid overdose deaths among older adults because sometimes those things aren't reported um, in, a, in a way that's meaningful. Um, if if uh, use of opioids results in a fall, for instance, what is the cause of death reported? And it isn't always uniform uh, state by state or community by community. So we really can't trust that the data are representing um, opioid overdose deaths and we also can't trust that a fall is really just a fall. Stephanie? Yes. I'm wondering, we have a couple questions that kind of fit in with some of the things that you just said. And uh -huh. I'm wondering, when would you like to take those now or would you like to wait and let me know? Well, we might cover some of them when we get to the strategies. Well, some of them are about data. Okay. The first one is, and I think you just kind of touched on this, um, what data can we find at more local or regional levels in regard to our older adults? I'm most familiar with where we go in the state of Nevada. <laughs> and uh, we would look at, um, the medical examiner rates and Nevada is in the process of um, trying to clarify what the medical examiners are reporting causes of death so that uh, those um, really important facts can be teased out. And I'm not really sure what other states are doing, but I can say this is a really good thing um, for those of you who are in your individual states to look into, you know, who provides the data and what exactly are, are they providing? Chuck, do you have anything to add about those? Yeah, we, we're going to give you some suggestions towards the end about uh, organizations that are holders of the data and also holders of, of the work that's, that's likely being planned and or being being done already. So we'll talk about sort of different kinds of more sort of 21st century uh, sort of partnerships to think about and different different kinds of groups at, at state and local levels that, that likely have uh, have some data. Um, it, we were, again, encouraged by how much data we found, but also discouraged by how often some of these federal uh, data sources don't do specialized reports for this population. They're just not used to doing that. So they do it every five years instead of every year. Um, you know, so some of this data, as we agree with you, is, is feeling like it's already two or three years old. Um, some of the bigger organizations at the federal level haven't recognized this conversation. <laughs> um, someone just mentioned in the, in the chat that um, their state was working with emergency room data. 
Um, but this isn't the same as what the medical examiner reports. And hopefully the medical examiners are taking into account what happens in the ER, but we don't know the process sometimes. And I guess the important thing would be to clarify that um, where you have the power in your own state. All right. Well, if you'd like, I'll hold the other questions until we get a little further in. Okay. Well, moving to what we do know, we know that substance use disorders among older persons are among the fastest growing health problems in the US. And despite this, <laughs> elderly remain underestimated, underidentified, underdiagnosed, and undertreated pretty much just like everybody else. And older individuals are using illicit drugs and meeting criteria for substance use disorders at higher rates than previous geriatric cohorts. And this results in negative impacts on their ment medical and psychiatric conditions um, if they have them, and many of them do. Just to look at older and more vulnerable, um, I, I guess we can see by this slide that there's robust evidence showing increased number of older adults will need substance uh, use disorder care in the coming decades. And the previous slide showed data with older adults with a, a substance use disorder had doubled by 2020. And there will be increased demands on the treatment system. So we will need expansion of treatment facilities and development of effective service programs. And I look back at, we've just gone through several years of COVID and one good thing that happened there was the increased use of telehealth and the acceptability and the fact that it's uh, reimbursable now. And so we, we do have more ways for people, but that can't fill the entire gap and uh, between treatment needed and treatment provided. So there, there are a lot of things to think about uh, with this situation. Um, another aspect is uh, substance use disorders in older adults, they may be a continuation uh, of use that began in younger years. But for some, um, especially those that begin using during a transition or a loss, um, losses such as health declines or loss of um, social members of the social group, uh, loss of mobility, uh, loss of independence, um, chronic pain, those things, um, they may be new, become new users of substances. And so we would call that late onset as opposed to early onset. Older adults are more likely uh, to have other conditions or situations that impact their use. They may have more, uh, they do have more adverse events from psychoactive medications. Um, they may use sedatives or benzodiazepines more, and that has been associated with risks for, of falls in older populations. And when you combine alcohol and prescription medications, um, the effects are even more detrimental. Um, in fact, in a national Medicare study of Medicare beneficiaries, heavy drinking more than doubled the risk for hip fractures. Um, and all of those leads to costly hospital admissions and lengthy stays. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, we were talking about early onset and late onset. Uh, we didn't discuss problem gambling among trends, but gambling and over older women is a perfect example of late onset because late in life when um, women are left bereft uh, with a shrinking social group, 
um, they often turn to either alcohol or amazingly um, gambling. And part of it is the excitement of it and part of it is the social aspect. But we are seeing a lot of older women, just as an aside, who um, become problem gamblers at a later age. Um, moving to co-currents. Um, As you can see, dual diagnosis for obvious reasons is gonna be a growing problem among older adults. Um, one in 10 primary care patients with depression, anxiety disorder, or at-risk alcohol use experiences suicidal ideation. Um, one study in the American Journal of uh, geriatric psychiatry found the prevalence of older adults with comorbid substance abuse and mental disorders varies by population, but ranges from 7 to 38 percent of those with psychiatric illness and from 21 to 66 percent of those with substance use disorder. Um, depression and alcohol use are the most commonly cited co occurring disorders in older adults. And dual diagnosis in older adults is associated with increased suicidality and greater inpatient and outpatient service utilization. Um, as usual, data on treatment are limited. But there are recommendations uh, that have been adapted from evidence-based treatment of younger adults. Not sure how appropriate that is, but it's what we have. Uh, older adults with substance use and older adults with mental health problems. So there's that. So dual diagnosis among older adults is, is a concern and we need well-designed prevention, early intervention and treatment studies that really specifically identify um, co-occurring disorders in older adult populations because it's the data um, base that we are missing. Um, speaking, speaking specifically to problem gambling in older adults, it's very common for older adults who receive treatment for substance misuse to suddenly develop a different problem such as problem gambling. And it's not uncommon to switch from the treatment uh, substance or behavior to a different and ob ob than not previously tried substance or behavior. Um, and one more important thing to note is that certain medications, such as some medications for restless leg syndrome, which happens to be very common among older adults and commonly treated with medication, um, those medications uh, may have side effects that initiate either compulsive gambling or compulsive shopping. Now, a well-informed provider is going to be on the lookout for and ask specific questions during the initial adjustment to the medication uh, for restless leg syndrome. But it's also good for friends and family to be on the alert for those signs too. Um, moving on to um, older, a little bit more about older adults and suicide. Um, on this side, we see some of the important data concerning older adults and suicide, and the risk and protective factors are an important approach to preventing suicide because suicide prevention efforts seek to reduce the risks for suicide and strengthen the factors that protect individuals from suicide. A few examples of the risk factors may be depression and other mental health problems, including problem gambling. And treatment is paramount. Uh, substance use problems, including prescription medication, again, treatment and ongoing maintenance support is paramount. Phys for physical illness, disability, and pain, which comprise another set of risk factors, yes, treatment for all of these is important. But many chronic illnesses or conditions among older people are brought on 
or exacerbated by physical activity, inactivity, by lack of healthy, nutritious food. Treatment by primary care is very important, as is healthy eating and exercise. So you need all of them. And uh, what I'm saying is that a lot of the chronic issues that adults have can be solved before they happen um, with activity, with, um, with diet and exercise and regular checkups. That's not to say that they don't all <laughs> occur anyway. Um, social isolation is another risk factor among older adults. Locating programs for social isolation actually is pretty, pretty uh, uh, easy, but getting an older adult to attend may be pretty difficult. Um, if they have physical limitations or shyness or something unfamiliar, or sometimes just they don't want to. And some strategies that Chuck's going to talk about later can help about the, uh, help with um, how you might approach this. Um, protective factors are mentioned briefly here and covered in more detail later. Um, care for mental health and physical problems, uh, Social connectedness needs to be maintained and built, uh, especially among older adults. And developing and teaching skills in coping and adapting to change. Uh, this may consist of new learning uh, skills or new ways of doing things. So um, there are strategies that can be used. Um, as you can see, these. Issues may appear to be simple when we started, but I'm now going to turn the floor over to Chuck for a poll and to expand on the complexity of the issue. All right, um, you, we'll talk about interactions in just a second. I wanna sort of take another moment to engage you all um, in terms of thinking about factors. We've, we've spent a lot of time in the last hour now kind of talking about a number of different issues with regard to demographic change and, and risk and use and, and some of what's driving that. Um, so as we move into this next section, we're going to go into to more of these issues. So I want to do a quick poll and ask you to, to say a little bit about which of these uh, troubles you the most. So you can kind of pick the one that you're most worried about when you think about older adults um, and substance use issues and, and the related consequences that, that are much more significant and severe uh, in pretty quick ways. Which of these issues trouble you the most? All right, let's go ahead and, and publish results and then we'll start diving into this a little bit. It should be up there, Chuck. Can you see it? I, I sure do. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so seeing lots of folks with all the above, um, the way I would agree, um, hearing that, that each of these issues for a variety of reasons can't be thought of in isolation. Um, because they have relationships to each other in such significant ways, which we'll, we'll kind of share that in just a moment. So I agree with the, the idea of thinking of all the above ought to be things on our radar screen. Um, so in terms of sensitivity, that has a little bit to do with metabolism of, of alcohol and other drugs, in particular uh, psychoactive uh, drugs, if, if folks are prescribed uh, certain kinds of, of prescriptions. Um, metabolism changes significantly between those years of between 50, 60, 70. Um, I can tell you my, my, um, my own grandfather um, 
experienced pretty serious uh, sort of what we would call reverse tolerance. He would, in his retirement, uh, stand at the, the little local bar in town. And it, when he was probably 40 or 50, he could probably drink six to eight glasses of beer. Um, and, and then he would sort of stumble his way home. Um, towards the end, as, as he got to be 70 years old, he could have one beer and then lose his balance. Um, so very significant differences in what, again, sort of reverse tolerance, and that happens not just with alcohol, but with all kinds of issues that relate to metabolism. Um, sort of lots of issues with health problems that Steph kind of hit on in terms of chronic health conditions that interact with, with some of the, the use issues. Uh, and again, how common uh, loss and isolation is. I really appreciate Steph offering so many examples of loss because it, it may be loss of a partner, but it may be loss of independence. It may be loss of mobility. It may be loss of, of sort of interacting with people in your profession or career. It could be all kinds of loss that, that could in fact trigger and sort of telescope uh, someone into a substance use problem uh, for sure. Cognitive and functional impairments can, can make it harder to detect. So, so again, the sort of notion of, of thinking carefully about screening and the way that we do screening uh, in respectful ways is, is really critical in, in terms of being able to understand and tease out what's happening in somebody's life as these interactions between these issues are all happening. And again, we'll talk a, a moment more about medication so we can close the poll out. Um, so for those of you who want to do that deeper dive into physiological issues, we're really talking about changes in, in metabolism that happened. Um, so pharmacokinetics of alcohol and other substances, if you can say that word uh, in the afternoon, uh, increasing, increasing the susceptibility about not only the, the, uh, the sort of euphoria, but other kinds of harmful effects of use um, all change as that metabolism changes. I'm mean, you the example of, of my grandfather who, who had, who went from being able to drink eight beers to drinking one or two and then not being able to, to stand. Um, and, and I think, again, the sort of that led to all kinds of dangerous issues for him. Being able to make his way home, even though it was two blocks, was, was much more dangerous for him. Um, so thinking about older adults being more likely than young people to have chronic health conditions. So while it's dangerous for anyone of any age to have co-occurring issues with health uh, and mental health and, and use, it's, it's compounded when, when folks uh, have, are, have these issues when they're older adults, uh, because it's far more likely to interact with prescription medications, as well as sort of issues with regard to metabolism and balance. And, and the consequences are much greater. Again, if, if you take a fall when you're 30, is nothing like taking a fall when you're 60 or 70. So all of that, that physiological issue, I think, is worth exploring in some depth when you talk with folks in your community. Um, we think about the population of psychoactive drugs. Now, again, is sort of what we're talking about there, the likelihood that somebody might be taking Xanax or Zoloft or Prozac or Celebex or Letzapurin. I mean, there's so many of those these days. Um, women being more likely to be prescribed some of those than men. But, but again, as older adults move into that, that cohort, they're far more likely to be, to be prescribed psychoactive medications. Um, that, and they're more likely to then uh, increase the, the likelihood that they will use non-medically. So as they learn how to use the substance for what it was prescribed for, they're also learning behaviors about how to use it to deal with other issues. So if they may have been prescribed it for anxiety, but they might also use it as a, as a related issue to deal with boredom or, or sadness. Um, so we know overwhelmingly that psycho, uh, psychoactive medications present some significant challenges and risk uh, for this population because of the sheer number of folks who are prescribed and then that learned behavior about I can use it as prescribed, I can also use it with, with all kinds of other mental health conditions that I'm trying to struggle with, I might also be using alcohol on top of it. Um, so all of that stuff makes this sort of graph, uh, the, the tying up what, what you heard Steph talk about in the last hour, is that, that you can't isolate these issues with this population. We know that, that 
they interact in both ways. So somebody may be engaged in some at-risk drinking that then creates a problem with their sleep pattern that the fact that they're not sleeping creates to the likelihood that they're getting depressed and their suicidal ideation goes up. So you hear from the top of the left column to the bottom of the right, there's an arrow. Um, in the same way, you think about an issue on the right where, where there's a mental condition or disorder where somebody is, is actually drinking or using cannabis to deal with, with the emotions or the effects. Of, of trying to struggle with that mental disorder. So you see an arrow on the top right going down and dealing with, with drugs uh, or cannabis and illicit drugs or prescriptions to, to try to handle and deal with and alleviate symptoms from, from a, a situation on the right. So in, in this, this graph, I think it, it just ties up so much of what Steph talked about for me is that, that it's really important that we carefully consider the ways that all of these issues interact. So at-risk drinking, cannabis, illicit drugs, and prescriptions, and its relationship to consequences, health problems, suicide, and mental disorders. Um, lots of, again, sort of very complicated sort of interactions and, and issues back and forth. Um, so we, we do want to move into strategies, um, Steph. So I'll, I'll mention some of the first ones, and then I'll invite you into the conversation to talk about some of the others. Um, you've heard a lot of just general conversation around building awareness, and I, I love the idea that, that, that I think that um, if you're going to go to a registry and look for a program, a strategy, an evidence-based practice that's been studied to be effective with this population, you'll find some, um, but it's scant. And this, the, the evidence for universal prevention in this population is even more scant. It's just harder to find sort of generalized ways of, of doing that awareness building. So I think starting with, with sort of creating that, that awareness in your community about what we just spent the last hour going over is, uh, is, is well worth the effort to, to raise awareness about putting this, this population on the radar screen for coalitions, for health departments, um, for primary care docs, for all kinds of folks that interact with, with these folks uh, to have a better understanding. Um, there's certainly evidence that health education programs have, have increased knowledge regarding unhealthy alcohol use. So I'll share with you some examples when we get to resources about uh, state departments of public health or other kinds of specific um, state and, and local health, uh, public health agencies that have developed awareness programs specifically targeting um, healthy drinking as you age. Now you think about that message for underage wouldn't, wouldn't fit. I mean, that feels really sort of um, anti-intuitive for us as we think about prevention is we're never encouraging healthy use of, of a substance. Whereas when we're talking about older adults, that, that the use is likely already there. So we're talking about how to avoid risk, how to avoid harm, how to avoid interactions, how to invite in, uh, avoid danger with regard to falls. So all of the consequences um, are more immediate in that person's life to focus on reducing harm uh, in that sense is, is part of that. In the, and Steph, I'll uh, transition to, to uh, a little bit on health literacy and then we'll stay there with that and then we'll go to the next set of strategies. So say a little okay. bit. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, health literacy. You know, um, what is it? <laughs> Actually, the CDC has taken this ball and run with it. Um, and the reason is, according to the CDC, 71% of people over age 60 had difficulty in using print materials. 80% had difficulty using documents such as forms or charts. 68% had difficulty with interpreting numbers and doing calculations. Uh, strategies for providing information include empowering older adults, adults, providing trusted sources of information, using a variety of methods for providing information to accommodate different learning styles, um, making health messages clear, concise, and solution-oriented, and of course, uh, what we already do, accommodating people with cognitive, visual, or hearing challenges. But one of the biggest things that the CDC has done is they have published new definitions for personal health literacy and organizational health literacy. Now, personal health literacy is the degree to which individuals have the ability to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. And organizational health liter literacy is the 
degree to which organizations equitably enable individuals to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. These new definitions do some very important things. They emphasize people's ability to use health information rather than just understand it. So they have to have the ability to use it. They focus on the ability to make well-informed de decisions rather than appropriate ones. And they acknowledge that organizations have a responsibility to address health literacy. And so it also promotes health equity, which is a very important issue now. So my suggestion is that anyone providing health care to older adults should go to the CDC's website, and you can just Google CDC health literacy. There's a link in our resource list also. <clears throat> and they have plenty of tools and details on how individually and as an organization, you can co you know, cover this base for yourself and your organization. And uh, Chuck, I'll let you go on with the next strategies. <laughs> That's OK. So, so thinking about some of the things we know about prescription, uh, uh, sort of prevention, prescription drug prevention, more in the last decade of what we learned that prescriber education is is really an important practice. So where there where there are strong evidence for a specific kinds of intervention working with one population or with 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 a certain drug or drug using behavior, um, we know that that we can generalize somewhat when there's a lack of evidence. So prescriber education has been studied some with this population, um, but generally we know it it to be an effective strategy because of where it's been used elsewhere. So I. I advocate for, for the use of, of evidence-based practice that are based on research when, when the studies haven't been done with specific populations. And I think um, as Steph and I looked and, and scanned and dove into finding evidence-based strategies, um, I think we had in some cases needed to rely on the ways in which we looked at strategies for other populations that have been effective. So prescriber ed makes tons of sense to me uh, to educate prescribers. Um, medication management also makes makes some sense as well. I think that in the way that we're educating folks, um, both uh, from that prescriber side, but also from the consumer side or the patient side of things of helping folks understand the relationship uh, and interactions of the way that they're dealing with medications, helping folks uh, learn different ways to keep track of medications to be able to learn and, and to track both the effect and on their mood and their health and their physical mobility and their balance and all kinds of ways of, of helping folks better understand and keep track of what's going on with the ways that they're using uh, prescriptions and medications. Um, lots of evidence about motivational interviewing. Even with this population, we were pleased to find that there's there's a fair amount of evidence specifically studying uh, older adults and the use of motivational interviewing. Obviously, the challenge comes in with regard to um, whether older adults use specialized services or not, as we have opportunities with young people and, and, and uh, sort of middle-aged uh, adults um, interact in lots of different sectors and different places and different kinds of agencies. Older adults are far less likely to use specialized services uh, with regard to sort of psychiatric care or, or special kinds of of health related services more likely to use their primary care doc for most everything. Um, so they're using a single relationship most of the time for their health care. So making sure that we understand locally or in the county where you live, where folks are accessing care and thinking about putting these kinds of interventions in those settings. Um, so that we figure out where folks are going, because again, they're not going to 10 places, they're probably going to one or two. Um, screening and brief intervention, again, a fair amount of evidence that's there, even studied directly with this population. We're going to share uh, in a few moments a handout with you that, that will help you and direct you to uh, better understanding the data, the, the risk and predictive factors, as well as some of these interventions in terms of how, they're, how they've been studied. Um, I like the idea of a lot of, of training, training family and friends. Um, we're going to play a short clip in a moment of a, of a news story for you that talks about the ways in which you can do that. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of bounce back to that one in a moment in terms of strategies as well. Um, Chuck, could I just say, 
one more thing about the medication management. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the data show that two in five adults age 50 to 80, 41%, take two to four prescription medications. 23% take more than five. And 52% take two or more non-prescription medications. Only 29% of those have had a comprehensive medication review, CMR. So medication reviews for older adults is an evidence-based practice. It, uh, it has been identified as a best practice program and they often include state-sponsored free medication reviews. And if you want to know more about how those work and the importance of them, then we have a link for that in our resources. But it is very important. Most, most adults take a lot of medications and most of them never get a comprehensive medication review by a certified geriatric uh, pharmacist. So uh, that's a very, very important um, thing to really uh, add in there. Um, and that's my two cents about medication management. Cool. <laughs> I think a perfect transition, Steph, into one of the things that we can all do, regardless of where you're at, is, is sort of having the conversation and raising the awareness. But to do that, I think you have to be aware of some of the facts and, and take on the role of dispelling uh, misinformation or myths. Um, so we will um, bring up a poll and, and begin to explore some of what, what we know uh, as a yes or no, if you believe this to be true or not true. Um, and then we'll spend a little bit of time in a moment with Steph talking about each one of these. Please note there are actually four questions in the poll, so you just have to scroll to get to the last question. As these are coming in, Steph, I'm super encouraged by what, what we're already seeing. Um, I think that one of the things that's helpful for people to think about with, with these questions um, and, and the conversation that Steph will lead into in just a moment is what, what's, if we ask this slightly different way, and you know, we asked about what we know uh, as preventionists about this, if, if you ask the question differently and said, what, are your, what does your community think about this statement in terms of where you live? What are, what are the local folks, what would they say in terms of where you live, your neighborhood, what would they say? I think the answers would look a little different. Yes, I, uh, let's see, don't see the bottom two questions is my problem. The first two are pretty encouraging. <laughs> but I can't see what the results are for the bottoms. Can you um, use the slide on the right-hand side and scroll down? Oh, Please. yes, I can. <laughs> Good. Thank you. You're welcome. You can also make that box bigger by grabbing uh -huh. the bottom and dragging no, it down. Yes, so just, just to go through these, I think are we finished with the actual poll? Okay, so, so signs of alcohol or drug use in older adults are often mistaken for signs of aging or chronic illness. Yes, I actually had a doctor. I told him some symptoms and he said, well, you are getting older. And I thought, really? <laughs> From my healthcare professional. Um, older people are more likely than younger people to admit to having a problem. No, they were raised in an era where they are less likely to report a problem. Uh, when a person's been taking a prescribed medication for years, there's no reason for it to be reevaluated just because the person's older. No. Body metabolism, as Chuck said, changes, and a lot of things change. And we need regular reviews of our medication. And last, uh, older adults with a drug problem have likely been using continuously since they were young. As we learned about early onset, late onset, no, that is not the case. Late onset addiction in adults, older adults accounts for about one third and more women. 
so we can move on. You all did good. <laughs> all right, so poll number four asks us five different questions. Oops, let me back up. <laughs> Again, just know, like Chuck said, there are five questions, so you can scroll or make the box bigger to see them all. Um, once again, that's looking like everyone's doing a great job <laughs> for the most part. We have a little tie in number one. So I'm going to go ahead and start responding. For number one, more than half of all older people have memory problems or dementia. No, the majority of older people have brains that work normally. We all have issues of forgetfulness. <laughs> In fact, even the, at the oldest old, less than 30% have dementia. And that's 80 or over. Um, for number two, Older adults residing in nursing homes don't develop drug and alcohol problems. Well, no, they do <laughs> develop problems. Uh, and only an estimated 7% of older people are in nursing homes. Uh, women are more, three times more likely to be among them. Uh, but they still need to be monitored for ATOD use as they are still at risk. Polypharmacy can lead to a change in mental status. Yes, it can. But multiple medi medications have the potential to interact. And some of these side effects, such as delirium, confusion, depression, general malaise, dizziness, lightheadedness, can be mistaken for aging. So, uh, but it can be attributed to polypharmacy. The body's reaction to changes in medications remains constant with advancing age. No, as Chuck outlined so brilliantly, uh, our physiology changes, our metabolism changes, and that is not true. And finally, uh, if an older person says that a behavior is his or her last remaining pleasure, it's generally best to allow the person to continue as long as others aren't at risk. No. Stopping substance misuse and addictive behaviors can uh, increase an adult's quality of life and you know, bring them back into a sense of well-being. So we don't want to give up on them just if they give up on themselves. So I think everybody did a remarkable job on that. You know your older people. Chuck, would you like to lead into the... Yeah, thanks for engaging us on that. Uh, okay. Again, we want to play a short video. We're going to get to some, some additional Q&A uh, in just a moment. Um, so if the video will play, and it looks like it's not loading. <laughs> so let me try one more thing. Maybe I can try playing it directly from the site instead, since it won't load in the... And then we're going to hear a little ad, of course, probably because we're going to YouTube. So hold on one second. I'll... Everybody loves pizza. And at Paestro, we're creating the future of pizza. All right. I'm going to do some, some quick debriefing of that video. I like it because it's something that you can use. You can use it with your team, with your 
public health department, you can play it for your coalition. It, it went over a lot, a ton of what Steph talked about in the first hour, as well as some of the things that we just covered recently. Uh, and, and it makes the case, I think, in a very credible way for how to have the conversation in a, in a compassionate, sensitive, respectful way as well. So I really like the video. We wanna, we, we're gonna leave that link in there for you so that you can think about how to use it in the ways that you want to or need to. Um, say something about partnerships and then we'll move right into a Q&A so we get a chance to get to some of those questions that, that folks have been sitting on. I mentioned this earlier that, that many states and city departments on aging are, are the great resources to start with to see what's already happening, what's already been done, what data do they have, um, uh, begin to look at again sort of what, what sort of campaigns, strategies, interventions, services, consider all of those questions that we, we spent time looking at. Uh, are they looking at training professionals in motivational interviewing or screening? Are they working with primary care? Are they working with, with other kinds of senior services or centers? So starting with these kinds of partnerships, starting with state and city departments on aging, looking at health centers, um, looking at, at senior services or centers that specifically uh, focus on this population that have specialized care. Um, primary care is, again, still a major source of, of where, where older adults go for all kinds of answers. Um, think about specialized workers, uh, and this is sort of the next wave of, of us getting ready to do this. Uh, a lot of the workforce development that's happening um, in the next five years is happening with geriatric psychiatrists, gerontology nurses, uh, geriopsychologists, and geriological social workers. So think if you can say again all of those words, find those folks find out what sort of training is happening for them and with them. Make sure they're aware of all the things we just covered uh, in this, as well as think about associations like the American Geriatric Society. There's also journals specifically focused on this population, um, a number of journals that we could, could recommend and, and point you to. So think about partnerships. You don't have to do this alone. So know that, again, accessing this population is, is uh, a a significant bigger challenge than, than it is with, with other, other age groups. So knowing that you'll likely have to fig figure out how to have access to this population by considering the populations and the, the groups that are already working with them. Um, so Steph, say something about the handout and let's then let's take some questions. Hey, we put together um, as many resources as we encountered for um, this, particular webinar, but I'd like to say it's not comprehensive. It isn't all that is out there, but some of the primary sources are. And of course, I'm willing to be a resource if you're having trouble finding something, and I'm sure Chuck is too, as well as, um, you know, the others who are involved here. Um, but if you do have questions about them, hopefully none of the links are broken. and. Um, that will give you some good starting information. Sorry about that, I went the wrong direction. There we go. All right, our, our tech team is gonna throw some questions at us. All right, well, Dion has asked, does illicit drug use include drugs that were initially prescribed by a doctor, created an addiction, and now their only resource for getting more is through underground markets? Absolutely, there's evidence that that's true. I think it's been studied in more urban areas in terms of looking at, at, at sort of where prescriptions started um, with some populations, white, older men of a certain age, my age in that case, uh, who maybe started using prescriptions, whereas in more urban areas in different parts of the country, um, some populations have been using heroin earlier and, and that they may be using heroin and, and have moved on to, to fentanyl um, as oxy. Oxycontin and other opioids became far less accessible to folks. So, so both are true. So depending on where you live and, and sort of what race, ethnicity, gender issues interact, it's important to know. If you're in Chicago, it looks different than it does in Baltimore or San Francisco. Um, if you're in a rural area, access and availability uh, to illicit substances is, is a different ballgame. So I think that, that, that it's important to study where you're at and think Think about how much place matters with regard to trajectories of prescription drugs to heroin to, to fentanyl um, might be true, um, but it might be just as true that, that heroin's already on the scene. But, and don't you think there's another aspect to this is that um, inappropriate prescribing that happened 
um, maybe not so recently, but in the beginning of this whole uh, drug crisis, you know, opioid crisis, um, there were was prescribing going on without screening patients for the possibility that they were at risk, and then stopping medications without withdrawing them appropriately. And I'm and I'm sure hoping that that's being taken care of by educating doctors and other care providers better. Yeah, but I, I don't know that. The example you gave earlier about benzodiazepines is a great one, Steph. I think that 10 years ago, it was not well known that, that using benzodiazepines and OxyContin or a psychoactive substance was, was really dangerous with regard to overdose. Um, we're, we're learning more about its relationship to suicidality as well, but even, even a little bit of alcohol use in a benzodiazepine is pretty dangerous. And I don't, and I don't think many prescribers take the time to, to, to talk about that even today. Uh, Dion also asked, um, as a recovering addict, alcohol for three alcoholic for three decades, <laughs> I've wondered whether anyone is studying relapse rates among older adults with significant recovery time as a result of being prescribed potentially addicting medications for diseases of aging. Uh, my impression from what I've heard is that Older adults who go into treatment are very successful. Okay. One, um, oh. I can't quote anything. That's just through reading and, you know, yeah. but I'm sure I could find citations if you like. And, and I think that varies a little. I, I think there's still the field itself is, is trying to figure out how to better serve uh, women, for example, in treatment, and the same issues here. There are very different cultural issues that would show up if you're trying to successfully engage an older adult in treatment. There are different issues with regard to social networks, for example, and, and other, all of the complicated issues we've mentioned at the beginning of this webinar are, are, are things that would need to be woven into a treatment plan. Um, so I think that they're, they're still catching up on how to better sort of culturally and appropriately uh, deliver treatment services. But Steph is right, that you can absolutely be successful in recovery at any age. Um, and the evidence is clear that, that folks can go into recovery and be successful at 65 or 85. We have a quick question, but was CBD products included in the cannabis data? Very minimally. I mentioned it in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's keep going. We've got just a couple minutes and I have a few things to say. Um, how can we get community to recognize the issue and agree to help and correct it and get behind prevention efforts? That's a big question. <laughs> well, personally, I'm a big uh, proponent of prevention coalitions taking on changing their communities, ways of thinking and social norms. And I think that is one excellent beginning because you need to change communities and the way they're thinking. Uh, and the coalitions do a great job of that. Yep, I think Steph's avenue there is, is a great one. I think the other thing that folks get trapped in is, is sort of a, a dead end with regard to limited funding streams. If you're just going to rely on, on DFCs, for example, you might be always directed to deal with underage friction, underage sort of drinking as, as a priority and, and maybe one other drug you can deal with. But the idea of really doing a data-driven community level assessment and focusing prevention on populations um, is something that, that, again, has always been a principle in prevention, but I, I see more and more funders um, asking people to do that and to be able to have data to support the decisions of how they're going to engage uh, their community in prevention and which populations matter the most. Um, I see the CDC doing that uh, in, in much more rapid ways. So encouraging coalitions to branch out around, um, around the ways in which they think about funding sources. Um, is one of the things that they can do, because I think that that often is a barrier that's that's misperceived, that there's no money for, for doing this with this population. That's not true. Well, we, we've kind of run out of time. Um, I'd like to just take a moment and share my screen and um, let folks know that there's more, there's more, there's more uh, out there for you. 
and um, we would love to have you visit our social media sites, our websites, our Facebook page, and um, you can get more information about all of the um, activities that are sponsored by the um, P Great Lakes PTTC. We've got some upcoming events. I'm gonna send all of this information to you in an email so you don't have to rush to write it down. There's some great things coming up. We are gonna be looking at trends um, with girls and women, uh, some uh, kind of a sister webinar to the one you've just experienced. And then again, you will be redirected to a short survey. Um, another way to do it is to um, copy and paste the URL here or scan the code, but no worries on that. You should all be redirected. And we wanna thank you. Thank you so much for being here, for participating. And it sure looks as though folks felt that this was really helpful. So thank you to both Chuck and Stephanie.